Hi everyone, welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting adversarial market research. So supply chain, modern supply chains, are extremely dependent on, uh, on fairly sophisticated software products. And it has been the case in developed countries for more than two decades. And, um, and so we have a, a, a big, I would say, case of concern to actually pick the right sort of tools, the right sort of, of vendors, actually. Because even if we are looking at the largest you know, supply chains around, even the largest companies operating the largest supply chains can't afford to re-engineer internally every single piece of um, the applicative landscape software-wise that you need to actually run a modern supply chain. So there is um, vendors to be picked. And uh, the question of interest for this present lectures will be how to conduct uh, actual market research in the field of enterprise software. And my proposition that I have for you is that there are ways that can give you, I would say, very reliable results, scientific even. And there are also ways to conduct um, market research that are, I would say, severely misguided. Uh, and, that, uh, and that, unfortunately, we not uh, give you the sort of result that your company might be seeking, which is to identify the, the best vendors, meaning the vendors that will generate the highest return on investment for, uh, for your company. By the way, uh, as a disclaimer, I am the CEO of Locad, which happen to meet the definition of being uh, an enterprise software vendor that operate in the field of, uh, of supply chain. So the world of enterprise software is vast, to say the least. And uh, in, in the screen, you can see a list of acronyms that reflect you know, typical products that are found uh, in the landscape of, um, of, um, of most, I would say, modern large companies running extensive supply chains. And behind every single acronym lies you know, a concept and where you have typically dozens of vendors operating worldwide, and typically a couple of them being open source, the other, the other ones being not open source. And, um, and, um, and, and a company can always obviously uh, decide to re-engineer internally um, some of those products. But to my knowledge, the proposition that you would like to re-engineer entirely in-house every single aspect of the supply chain is not a very realistic proposition. There is just too much uh, to re-implement, even looking at very, very large companies. So, uh, uh, so basically, it boils down in the end to actually pick for those products um, uh, vendors. And even if your goal is to actually re-engineer you know, your own in-house solution, uh, well, it turned out that starting with, uh, by doing a proper uh, market research study on the field of interest is obviously uh, the, probably a very reasonable starting point to know what you actually want to engineer. And now, the problem that I have, and I will start with a piece of anecdotal evidence, is that I believe that the, the knowledge that is available you know, publicly to actually sort out all those vendors is of exceedingly low quality. And just to give you uh, an example of that is that if we compare um, the Wikipedia page on uh, the Suez Canal obstruction incident that just happened you know, a few days ago, uh, compared to the Wikipedia page on, uh, on ERP, well, it turned out that the, the page about the Suez Canal obstruction is at present time, although the incident only happened a few days ago, is, um, is of very, very high quality. Um, it is very well written, well sourced. It provides you know, elements in ways that are very, very insightful. And, um, and if um, I look at the page, uh, the, again, the Wikipedia page, also an online encyclopedia about ERP, um, the, the quality of the, of the, of the page uh, on the Wikipedia about the ERP is of very, very low quality. Uh, and and um, to the point that I would, for example, never advise you know, any student to actually uh, go to the Wikipedia um, uh, page about the ERP to even, uh, I would say, remotely understand what ERP is about. And you see, we have this problem, and here it's, it's even more puzzling because ERPs in their present forms were already kind of stabilized 20 years ago. So we have a problem with a, a domain knowledge that uh, not only is of very poor quality, although I'm presenting you know, fairly anecdotal evidence of that, um, and it's not, even getting even, it's not even getting better over time. And I believe that the problem that we are facing here is um, known as uh, epistemic corruption. 
And so Sergio Sismondo uh, defines epistemic corruption. Uh, it's when a knowledge system importantly loses integrity, ceasing to provide the kinds of trust and knowledge expected of it. And this is an excerpt from uh, a, a paper published by uh, Sergio Sismondo uh, in 2021 about epistemic corruption, the pharmaceutical industry, and the body of uh, medical science. And, um, and so this problem of epistemic corruption uh, is absolutely not specific to, um, I would say, to enterprise software. I believe that it's also a problem present in many, uh, in numerous other fields. Um, the reason why I'm paying attention to uh, the field of medical science, it's because it's a field that is very, very mature in this regard. And those problems uh, which are, uh, are, have been, I would say, extensively been, uh, they have been, uh, been extensively studied uh, over the last, uh, the last past decades. And here, uh, if we look at, at what uh, the medical science has to say uh, on this regard, there is a fascinating study by uh, the Cochrane Library, actually. Uh, and they have produced um, a meta analysis what is known as a meta-analysis of over 8,000 medical trials. And what uh, they have seen is that um, when, it, when those trials um, have been you know, triggered from uh, uh, with, I would say, uh, industry funding involved, what the, what this, uh, what the, the Cochrane Review has, has demonstrated is that whenever there in, uh, I would say industry funding is involved, um, there is a massive bias in the uh, outcome of the trial that tend to magnify the positive aspect of the treatment being considered. And similarly, you also have a, a massive bias to, um, uh, to basically uh, underestimate the uh, negative side effects that are also associated with, uh, with the treatment known as iatrogenic effects. And the thing that is very, very interesting in this very, very large um, uh, meta-analysis of 8,000 trials is that, um, according to um, the, the Cochrane Review, is that there is nothing that differentiates um, trials funded by the industry, and all those, those trials are operated you know, by, by independent third-party companies, so it's not like the, if the pharmaceutical industry was doing the trial themselves. Um, so it's highly regulated, highly controlled, highly audited. And what they point out is that the trials cannot be differentiated in terms of whether there is uh, industry funding or not. So the trials are exactly the same. And uh, if you actually inspect the trials uh, and you look at uh, the methodology, um, the authors, the, uh, everything, you cannot, if, you, if, it's, if basically um, the funding is not specified, you cannot you know, infer whether it's a, it's a trial that was actually triggered by the industry or by another party. And that's, that's very interesting because they see that you can have, a, a, I would say, an industry level distortion that is just caused by um, the very presence of funding. And I believe, and, uh, and again, um, to quote uh, um, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, who was a Danish 19th century uh, philosopher, is that as the world changes, the forms of corruptions becomes more cunning, but they don't get any better. And you see, it's not, I would say, what we're looking with a phenomenon of epistemic corruption, it's not like the sort of old school corruption where it's just a bribe. It's more like a distortion of the field of knowledge uh, uh, in its entirety uh, to the benefits of, of whoever happened to be the dominant vendors at the time. And if we, and, but in order to understand exactly, I would say more precisely what is going on, I believe we need to have a closer look at what another science has to say, which is um, experimental uh, psychology. And so um, Robert Saldini, uh, a researcher, published uh, a, very, a, a completely fascinating book called Influence, the Psychology of Persuasion in uh, 1984. So um, Saldini is a very, very peculiar character. Actually, as a researcher, he decided to go three years undercover to infiltrate um, the most uh, influential organization of his time. So that's, that's quite stunning for, for, for a researcher. So he decided to infiltrate those organizations, which included telesales companies, uh, lobbies, groups, religious movements. And his idea was to basically observe what sort of influence techniques was at play. And what he did in his career is at first collect information, which he did in those three years underground. And then 
later as a researcher with his peers, he actually um, uh, spent pretty much his, his life in terms as a researcher to replicate the sort of insight that he had gained during his uh, undercover years um, uh, to replicate them under, I would say, more controlled environment in order to actually produce rigorous science on top of those initial insights. And by the way, the, the infiltration method was um, more mundane than it seems. I mean, mostly it was about applying for a job, get hired, undergo the training, and just stick around for, uh, for a certain period of time just to get a feeling of how the things are actually operating. And, uh, and, and here, um, uh, Seldini identified among the, the influence mechanism a very simple mechanism called reciprocity. And reciprocity is something very intuitive, is if I do something good for you, you will be inclined in doing good, something good for me. And you see, this is something that where m most humans um, uh, um, rea react in this way. And uh, however, the surprise of Robert Seldini was not that reciprocity exists, is that reciprocity can actually be uh, abused in ways that are absolutely spectacular. And if you play the cards right, you can get a, a completely outsized effect out of this reciprocity mechanism. And to illustrate that, um, Robert Saldini gives the example of, of, of the Krishnas, you know, uh, a religious movement that emerged in the very late 60s and that, that grew during the 70s. And essentially, um, uh, Krishnas because became one of the most uh, successful uh, flower vendor of all time by pioneering a, a sales technique that had absolutely staggering results. And the techniques was actually very simple. They were selling flowers uh, and they, uh, in, in airports, and the technique consisted of simply picking passengers at random and then giving a flower to the passenger. And, just, uh, and when the passenger was actually trying to return the prize, the, the, return the flower, um, you would say, no, no, this, this flower is given, but you can decide you, to give us, you know, to, to pay for it if you wish to. And this is it. So the, they were not, so the Krishnas were simply giving away the flower and just telling people that they can pay whatever they want. And they could even pay nothing if, uh, if they wanted to pay nothing. And um, the thing that was, uh, uh, that was completely, I would say, uh, a surprise was that not only uh, they managed to sell an order of magnitude more flowers with this technique than any uh, uh, flower vendor ever managed to do in, a, in an airport, but also the amount of money that the Krishnas were getting per flower was also an order of magnitude higher than any regular flower vendor would get in an airport by just selling you know, a single flower. And, and this, this, the, it was so successful that it was actually a, a, a very, it did massively contribute to actually fund the Krishna's movement during um, the 70s. And here, uh, uh, Cialdini analyzed, and later he actually reproduced that in controlled environment, mostly with playing with students, is that you see here, this is very interesting. This is a, a, a mechanism that uh, very um, smartly abused this mechanism of reciprocity, where you force people to actually state in monetary terms how much they value you know, uh, what has just been given to them. And, and here people uh, want to kind of flush out their debt uh, because they have been given and they don't necessarily want to preserve a debt against a, a stranger that they don't really know. And so uh, this ended up uh, being a, 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 a very, very effective sales technique. And actually the sales technique was so effective that actually giving away flowers did end up getting banned in the following years in most US efforts. And I believe that um, reciprocity, and, and more specifically, the abuse of reciprocity, is really um, the crux of the woes that are currently plaguing uh, enterprise software. And we will get, be getting back to that. But this is really this psychological mechanism that is, that is at play. So this, um, this lecture is actually the fifth lecture of my second chapter. Um, so in this, uh, in this series on supply chain, in the, first, um, in the first chapter, I presented my views on supply chain, both as a field of study and, uh, and as a practice. And in particular, I pointed out that supply chain is essentially a collection of wicked problems as opposed to tame problems. So it's, it's problems that don't lend, lend themselves easily to straightforward analysis just because we have so many uh, wicked aspects where what other people do in the market can completely undermine the validity of the answer of, uh, of, of what we have for a given problem. And so I decided to devote the entire 
second chapter on methodology on ways to actually cope and, uh, and, and obtain, I would say, rigorous results when facing all those wicked problems. And here, uh, and we have seen in particular a series of methods, some were um, qualitative, some were more of a quantitative nature. So supply chain persona was, um, I would say, a, a qualitative method. The experimental, um, um, the experimental optimization is more on the quantitative side. And today we are back to the, um, to the, quanti to the qualitative problems of, of basically ma of, of doing market research in the field of enterprise software with um, a hint of a specific interest for supply chain problems, although what I'm presenting today is not exactly super specific to supply chain software. It applies, I believe, to more generally to all pieces of enterprise software. So let's recap what we have seen in, um, in the very first lecture of, uh, of this second chapter, uh, in the Personae lecture. So we have seen that uh, essentially vendors do what vendors do. So, um, so when you ask a question to a vendor, the vendor is just going to present you know, what they are trying to sell in the most favorable light possible. And this is, um, and expecting anything else is kind of foolish. And there is even, you know, this, this very notion has been even been embedded for centuries in the law, in the Roman law, um, with the idea of the dollar's bonus, the, the good lie. So, uh, yes, merchants are lying, but it is kind of expected, you know, this is what happens when you have something to, to sell. And by the way, this is not even fraud, this is even, you know, legally uh, uh, admitted. And, and uh, I believe more specifically that there is another sort of, uh, of problem that arise from case studies. And that's what we have seen in one of my previous lectures is that case studies, um, which are invariably positive case studies, uh, uh, basically a case study is essentially a piece of work that demonstrates you know, all the, the, the return on investment that can be obtained uh, by deploying a solution of some kind. And case studies that demonstrate you know, negative returns are exceedingly rare. And what I've shown is that um, by bringing you know, a client or uh, an analyst into the picture, you don't get, uh, um, as a research format, something that is more objective. But on the contrary, you get something that has even more bias. So basically, you pile up the bias of the vendors themselves with the bias of uh, the client company that has plenty of interest of its own. Uh, and if there is like a market research firm uh, uh, involved on top, then you get also also those those biases piling up. So, um, in conclusion, that was the conclusion of this previous lecture. Is that if you look at case studies in the field of enterprise software, it's literally glorified infomercial. So again, this is a dollars bonus at play. Uh, this cannot be trusted, and this cannot be used as a foundation if we want to have some kind of trusted knowledge. Um, that will let us assess, uh, you know, the respective qualities of the vendors. And so let's dig into how, uh, how can we actually conduct market research. And I will first present how not to do uh, market research because there are plenty of things that are very intuitive but unfortunately very, very wrong. And this is what I call, uh, the, I would say, the direct market research approach. And then we have the adversarial market research, which I believe is a, a vastly superior form of market research that has uh, many advantages. And the first, uh, the first one being that you can actually get results out of it that you can actually trust, which is uh, a, a massive plus, I believe. So classical, uh, I would say direct market research typically goes as follows. The recipe is very, very simple and intuitive. First, if you're, you know, um, if you're, um, so who, who can conduct, you know, market research studies? That can be a company that has, uh, that operates a supply chain and they want to have, uh, to, to find a, a vendor to uh, solve one of their specific problem. So that can be, you know, the client uh, itself. Um, but also it can be consultants. Consultants um, um, carry all sorts of, of missions for companies, but typically assisting companies in making, you know, um, strategic choices is one a very classic type of missions for consultants and typically consultants end up being involved in the choice of novel technologies, novel vendors. Uh, so, th so this uh, market research is also of interest to them. And then as a third class, you have the specialists, you know, the market research firms that are where their, their business is literally assessing the vendors that are present on the market. 
And typically, the, the, the typical methodology followed by all those actors when it comes to market research is just to ask um, questions. So first, you compile a list of questions. You know, can you do this? Do you support that? Do you have case studies in this area, et cetera, et cetera. So you compile questions. So in, in, uh, in for example, for supply chain optimization, that would be, uh, can you do time series forecasting? Question. Do you support uh, MOQs, minimal order quantities? Um, do you have a case study on uh, aerospace supply chain? You know, that, that would be the sort of, of question that can be asked. And so you compile a list of questions, uh, and then you compile a list of vendors, uh, and then you send all those questions to every single vendor. Um, you get the answers, you consolidate the answer, and then uh, through analysis of the answers, you, um, uh, that's, that's the thinking, um, you actually uh, elaborate, uh, uh, I would say, um, you gain insights in uh, the market, and so you can sort out who are, you know, uh, who is delivering the most uh, promising value for, um, for the company. That's uh, the line of thinking. I believe that um, this approach is deeply, deeply uh, misguided on two accounts that completely undermine this, um, this direct method. The first one is, uh, is this method extensively rely on the fact that you will get honest answers from uh, the vendors. And again, you are facing a situation where with, um, with dollars bonus, every single answer that you will get from the vendor will be you know, lies to some extent. And again, again, I'm, I'm saying that being a vendor myself, but this is just what vendors do when you have a product to say, do not ask if, you're, if you are actually selling powder, washing powder, my washing powder is going to wash whiter than white. This is just, you know, the way what vendors do. It's against their nature to the any other way. If you ask uh, an enterprise software vendor about can they do this, the answer will always be yes, we can. Yes, we can. No matter what is the question, and and actually. Usually, the problem is that with those sort of questions, that it's a subject of interpretation. For example, if you say, do you support MOQ? Well, depends on exactly what do you mean by supporting MOQs. If it's just about having one field where you can enter an MOQ and, uh, and have like a, a completely trivial numerical recipe attached to it, Yes, anybody can support MOQ, so any enterprise vendor is going to say, yes, we support MOQ, and that's not helpful. So first is that, and, and, and again, case studies and references are even worse because this is not, this might be counterintuitive, but you have even more bias in those materials than what you have in, let's say, the, the, the blunt specification of the, so, of, of, um, of the products, of the enterprise of the products. So the, on the first account, this, those questions are very misguided just because you get mostly a big pile of lines. It's not because you make the pile bigger that it's getting any better. Um, and then um, on the second front, you have also another problem, which is just as big as the first one, but of, of a completely different kind. The second problem is that you don't know which questions to ask. And that's, you see, if you look at the history of science, you would see that very frequently the problem was not to actually get the answers. You know, most of the historical scientific breakthrough, and when it comes to, to I would say, to knowledge, the, most of the breakthrough are not to get the answers. The, the breakthrough are usually to even know which uh, sort of uh, which sort of right question is there. You know, figuring out what is the right question to be asked is usually vastly more demanding and difficult than actually getting the answers. For, um, for most questions, uh, getting the answer is just a pedestrian effort. You know, once you know the question, then yes, it will take time and resources to get an answer, but this is a very straightforward process. However, usually what is very, very difficult is that you don't even know which question to ask. And thus, that when I say what is very misguided about this methodology is that you pile a long list of questions that are usually completely missing the point. And I'm just saying that just because um, the, 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 the body, the entity that can be, again, client company, consultants, or market research firms, they don't know what are the, the key changes. You know, they don't have this sort of insider knowledge like, uh, like, like vendors do, actually, because they are on the front line, and typically they have been playing this game for, for decades. And so, by the way, uh, so this is, I believe this approach is typically misguided. And as a casual observation, uh, I typically observe that when consultants are involved, the problems are typically amplified because consultants, in order to justify their fees and the mission, are just going to inflate 
the number of questions. And again, it's not because you have a, a bigger pile of lie that you are going to get any better results or any better results out of them. No, it's just going to add to the confusion. It's not going to, uh, to, to, to make, uh, you're not going to make any headway toward the truth. So at the crux of the problems here, we see that we have a conflict of interest. This is the problem that is, uh, you know, impacting uh, vendors. That's why vendors, you know, can't give you uh, a direct, completely truthful answers about the respective qualities and weaknesses of their solution because it's not what vendors do. Uh, but I believe that there is a much more insidious, you know, and that's the elephant in the room, there is a much more insidious problem about conflict of interest from, um, from the, the market research firms, which are kind of the elephant of the room that have um, massive problems of conflict of interest of their own. And, and let's, let's have a closer look at that. So first, just to recap, I would say the two golden rules of conflict of interest. The first uh, golden rule is that conflict of interest must be publicly stated. Uh, by the way, this is what I did in uh, the very first lectures of this series. I presented the fact that I am, uh, that I am the CEO of a company that is actually an enterprise software vendor. And I reiterated this disclaimer in this, um, in this uh, specific lecture due to um, the topic of interest. And, uh, but then the, the, the second golden rule is that of conflict of interest is that you don't get to decide if you have a conflict of interest. It's not up to you. You see, that, that's, a, that's a mistaken uh, uh, assumption. Um, you get a conflict of interest if, according to um, general principles, principles generally agreed upon by uh, collectively, if your situation presents a conflict of interest. You know, it's not a, an assessment that you can make on yourself. That's, uh, that is general principles that apply to you and that define whether you have a conflict of interest or not. Now, if we want to, but what is exactly, you know, the sort of, of conflict of interest uh, that we are looking at? If we want to get to the specifics, um, uh, I would say for the old school flavors of conflict of interest, uh, w the World Bank has a very, uh, has a very insightful guide, basically, uh, by, by the way, intended for procurement teams on conflict of interest. And they present all the classical forms of, of conflict of interest. Um, there are things that are very, very crude, like just like bribes, like having well-placed relatives so that you can actually have direct monetary gains. Um, uh, I, I will be putting the link towards this document in, uh, in the description of the video later. But uh, fundamentally, those are, I would say, the sort of old school conflict of interest. Um, I, I don't believe that this is the sort of conflict of interest that are of interest for the world of enterprise software. Again, quoting again Soren Kierkegaard, is that as the world changes, the forms of corruption become more cunning, but they don't get any better. So you see, the, we have, uh, so in the software industry, we are proud to have developed, I would say, more cunning forms of, of, the, uh, of corruption. And so, um, well, wh what do we have exactly as sort of problems? Well, first, I would say um, trade shows. So ob obviously, trade shows on, the, on their own are just fine. Trade shows are perfectly fine. Um, the problem is that if the trade show is actually organized, by uh, a market research firms, because then uh, you see the market research firms end up taking the vendors as clients who will s suddenly become, you know, will expose in the trade show. In, the, in, this, in this sort of situation, if you have a trade show organized by a market research firm and uh, that this market research firm invites vendors to be, uh, uh, to be, you know, featured in this trade show for a price, but obviously paying uh, the market research firm, you have an absolutely massive conflict of interest. And by the way, uh, if, if we were to do that in, uh, in regulated domains like medical science, for example, in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, doing that would be a, a straight card, go to jail, like in the monopoly, you know. Um, so, so literally, this is pretty much textbook um, uh, massive conflict of interest. Um, there is also the very, I would say, the more uh, elaborate ways to just do uh, restaurants invitations or travel invitations where uh, an analyst of a market research firm is invited by, uh, by, uh, by a vendor to a restaurant or to an event or these sort of things. Uh, again, this really qualifies as, um, as, as a conflict of interest. And remember, you know, this is what I pointed out with the work of Robert Saldini and his peers is that this is uh, where the, um, the, the reciprocity principles come into effect, is that if you play your cards right, you can expect 
outside the return. So yes, it's just an invitation to, in, to a restaurant. It looks like very small, but actually you can get a very, a very large effect on that. Um, and it's exactly just like the Krishnas were managing to get to sell tons of flowers with this just simple gesture of, um, of goodwill. Obviously, you have another very elaborate mechanism consists of jab lending. So if you happen to be an analyst in a market research firm that, ha that, is, that has some notoriety, well, uh, 10 years down the road, you might be expecting to be hired by one of those vendors. And, uh, and I don't say, you know, six months down the road. I mean 10 years down the road. And yes, because people can afford to have the long view. You know, this is an established industry. Players have been around for a lo very long time. And so um, you cannot just look at the conflict of interest as if it was something where there is like a monetary gain that is, that is just right now. This is not, again, we are, uh, enterprise software is a sophisticated industry. Um, it, it's not about, you know, having a, an instant bribe. People can look far into a far distant futures and thus they can have a conflict of interest because they anticipate that even 10 years from now, they will earn a position in a vendor um, due to the fact that they have been very, you know, uh, they have actually praised this vendor in the past. Um, uh, and also, uh, as far as, again, market research firms are, confirmed, are concerned, um, you can also uh, amplify, you know, your, con your uh, conflict of interest, for example, by offering coaching and consulting services directly to the vendors. And that, that is an even bigger, uh, I would say, uh, conflict of interest, just because suddenly you extend your reach uh, into all sorts of missions. Um, and finally, uh, just to point out, um, the, the, the modern way to look at conflict of interest, you really need to look at uh, the corporate structure. You know, it's not about whether this particular person uh, actually earn money directly. If the employer is earning money and if the employer has a conflict of interest, then all the employees of the given company have a conflict of interest. And even um, from the modern standards, uh, we can't even say if uh, that uh, conflict of interest stops to the corporate boundaries. For example, if you have two companies that happen to have the same shareholders, essentially, uh, then basically um, a conflict of interest for company A can actually, you know, uh, 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 permeate company B just because they have shared ownership between the, the, the two companies. And that's, that's really the sort of problems that, that we're facing. And so, in conclusion, you see, when I look at market research, uh, especially from the specialist, I see that there is a very strong, especially the notable specialist, you have a pretense of, of neutrality, but, uh, but the reality is not. You see, um, the conflict of interests are so prominent that essentially you don't get neutrality. What you get is actually pay to win. And again, that, can, that, um, that cannot be, you know, escaped. At here, I believe that you see when I look at this uh, at market research in the field of um, of enterprise software, I see that there is a lot of wishful thinking floating around. You know, wishful thinking, where people say, "Well, yes, we have all those conflict of interest, but you know what? Um, it's okay. We have a code of conducts." Um, Yes, but it doesn't work like that. You know, that's, that's the interesting things, and that's the sort of things that uh, was illustrated, for example, by the, the Cochrane review about those 8,000 trials that I mentioned today, that I mentioned today, is that you see, even when you have everything in place, including independent organization, interest can permeate. So it's not because you have code of conduct, and by the way, if um, in the field of medical science, having heavily regulated, you know, operations, uh, heavily audited, uh, and control if, if, if they still have, you know, um, extensive bias and as, as demonstrated by the Cochrane Review, how can it be any other way in the field of uh, enterprise software which is um, uh, where there is absolutely not the same degree of care and attention paid to those elements? So code of conduct change absolutely nothing. Um, the idea also of, of having silos, you know, business units. It's not because a market research terms uh, uh, firm has um, uh, two distinct business units, one business unit that deal with the trade show, another business unit that contains the analyst that, um, that it address any problem, you know, uh, the problem at all. Uh, again, the conflict of interest will permeate the company across the board. And so um, uh, literally, 
this is, this is just an illusion that just because in a company you decided that in your organigram to have basically a left branch and a right branch, that suddenly um, the, the branching of the organigram itself is going to stop the conflict of interest from propagating. Only a, a very, very naive person would believe, believe, believe that. Also, another thing that well, it's, it's, it's very much about wishful thinking is that people think that, oh no, it, it's, it's okay, we are honest. This is not the problem. You see, I believe, and that's also, I, I, I think, the conclusion reached by the Cochrane Review is that uh, conflict of interest is not about honesty or dishonesty. It's about bias, most of it being unconscious. You see, it's, um, you never think about being biased yourself. You, know, you, you, just, you just think what you think. And, and, and you see, um, you can exhibit tons of bias uh, even if you don't think so. And again, that goes back to the uh, experiment on um, uh, the experiment carried by uh, Robert Saldini uh, in his field, is that you can engineer the bias and, and then when you actually ask people to do self-assessment, they will remain very confident in their capacity to remain unbiased. So you see, it has nothing to do with honesty and you can obtain uh, tons of severe bias with perfectly honest people. This is not the problem. And also, um, as a side thinking, is that you can't really address the problems through nonprofits um, just because, you see, nobody is going to do market research on super, super boring topics like, let's say, EDI, uh, um, you know, enterprise that are interchanged. You have a lot of enterprise software products that are exceedingly boring to engineer and to review. So nobody is, could be expected to do that, you know, for free, just like you, you can't expect, you know, people to audit uh, accounts of, uh, of, of, of companies for free. So, so the idea that you can have, you know, some sort of non-profit organization that step up is just not realistic. So now, how can we actually conduct market research? You know, and, and I believe that the simple idea, if you want to conduct proper market research, is to have an adversarial line of thinking. And so, by the way, uh, so I, I stole this idea from, uh, from, from Warren Buffett, actually. And uh, Warren Buffett is uh, one of the richest men on earth. He is probably among the most successful investor of all time. And, um, and his approach is, is actually, he has engineered a very simple recipe and he has been al already very, very public uh, uh, about this recipe. And the interesting thing is that although the recipe is very public and, it's, um, and, and, they, and they have been literally uh, Berkshire Hathaway, the company you know, um, uh, that, uh, that Warren Buffett founded uh, um, more than six decades ago, um, although the, the recipe is very much public, uh, it has never been very really copied, although it's, 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 it really perfectly makes sense. So, um, uh, and uh, and um, it was never really a secret. So Warren Buffett said in numerous interviews and several memos that his primary uh, uh, technique to do uh, market research is a silver bullet test. And what it, it's a question that if you had a silver bullet and you could shoot it and get rid of one of your competitors, who would it be? And this is a question that Warren, Burlett, uh, Warren Buffett sorry, asked to, uh, to the companies he's serving. And remember, Warren Buffett is an investor, so his job is literally to make uh, market, uh, market research. You see, as an investor, you need to identify uh, in, a, in an industry uh, w which company you should be investing in. That's, that's the essence of, I would say, of, of investment. And the problem uh, faced by Warren Buffett is, uh, is that whenever he actually tried to survey the market, well, every single CEO uh, that, is, uh, that is doing a decent job is going to present a very distorted view of his own company that presents the company in a highly favorable light. You know? And again, that's literally the job of the CEO to attract investors. And, and uh, talented CEOs are typically exceedingly talented at seducing investors. That's, that's literally uh, part of the job. And so um, one Buffett was facing you know, this conundrum, which is if they actually go through the direct method of asking questions, you know, even financial questions about the company, what they get is a big pile of lies. And again, uh, you would think, oh, but those are, he is asking for numbers that are corporate finance, but anybody who has any 
uh, familiarity with corporate finance uh, know that there are um, thousands of ways to fudge the numbers. You know, again, all completely legal. It's just a matter of presentation. It's just going to make the company looking as if it was striving, although it might have tons of hidden problems. So, uh, and, and so what Berkshire Hathaway did was to literally use this simple question that we asked the people to identify what are the, the, the actual good players. You don't ask a question about the company itself, you ask, the com uh, 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 you ask a question to the company uh, about its peers, and that li lies the crux. And suddenly you can get uh, a knowledge of much higher quality because by doing that you uh, you basically negate almost entirely all the problems that you had with uh, conflict of interest. So the way uh, I propose to actually conduct market research is uh, exceedingly simple. It's just two questions, essentially. Present yourself, and obviously that's a question that you want to address to, um, to software vendors, is present yourself and present your peers. And this is it. No other question whatsoever. And by the way, um, you could literally eliminate um, the first question. Uh, however, you know, out of courtesy, it's better if you ask people to present themselves first. So I am keeping the first question just so that it doesn't feel too rude. Uh, but fundamentally, it's only you know, the second, second question that is truly, truly of, of interest. And here, if we go back to the, the, to the two problems that I, I, I did point out, you know, for um, the, direct market, the direct market research approach, you know, the fact that you get, that essentially you get, um, uh, you get massive um, dollars bonus distortion, that was point number one, and point number two, you don't even know which question are the, one, the, the correct one to ask. Well, it turned out that if you go for this approach, first, um, concerning the distortion, well, if, a vendor tells you that another vendor, uh, a competitor, is actually a, a, a very talented rival, well, you can trust that. You know, it is not in the interest of the vendor to actually admit that this other vendor is actually a threat to them or that they actually have some admirable pieces of, of technology. So you see, uh, suddenly if they, are, if they admit that, then you can trust that it's actually true. Because you see, the, in the interest, um, the bias will only go one way to basically underestimate or mitigate you know, the sort of perception that they have about the competitors. So you can, if they say good things about certain competitors, you can uh, trust that to actually be true or you can have a much greater uh, confidence. Again, the vendor itself might actually have no bias, but they might not know the market perfectly themselves, so they can do you know, very blunt mistakes as well. They, they are not perfect. They just have a lot more insider knowledge. And then, um, and then when it comes to the sort of present your peers, uh, if you ask, you know, um, they can also present the sort of angle that are the sort of very relevant question that you should be asking, but you can't think about. You see, they could say, well, I admire this vendor because they are doing this and that, and those, those things look, you, 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 didn't, you hadn't thought about it initially. For example, if you, if you go back, you know, to the direct market research and you say, well, um, uh, uh, can you do sales forecasting? You know, a first vendor can say, first, this is not the right question. You should be asking about demand forecasting because what you're interested in is future demand, not future sales. That might be, you know, the sort of insight that you can gain from a, a first vendor. Um, the, the second vendor might actually say, well, the problem is that forecasting, what sort of forecasting? Maybe you would like to think in terms of not to have point-wise forecasting. Maybe you would like to have um, a probabilistic forecasting. And then maybe there are other vendors that would say, well, maybe it's, uh, you need to forecast plenty of other things, such as um, lead time forecast uh, in, on top of demand forecast. And maybe you would have even a fourth kind of vendors that would tell you, well, if you're asking questions about forecasting, um, maybe your supply chain is going to be very fragile against um, you know, all sorts of uh, event that you cannot forecast. So maybe you should rather, instead of thinking in terms of forecasting, you should rather think in terms of buffers. You know, all those, those perspectives are possible, and the only way to discover those sort of angles is to let, you know, vendors present their peers and present, you know, the strength of their peers. And so, literally, two questions, present yourself out of, um, uh, uh, um, just to be polite, and present your rivals, which really matter. And so, the second thing is, um, and then once you have a presentation of rivals, you can actually ask the vendor to rank the, uh, the vendors, just the, the vendors that I've just described. You, know, you rank the vendors starting from your best rival, the rival that you admire the most, 
to the rival that are the most irrelevant to you. This is it. So, so you see, you start with your, your best, uh, best rival and you go down the list to uh, the, the, the rival that are more and more indifferent to it. And this is it, you know, this is it. Um, there is a misguided idea that you can probably, that to ask vendors to rank their peers against, you know, 20 different metrics. Um, I don't think it's realistic. Um, your, your perception, uh, being a vendor myself, is not that thin-grained about, about the, um, I would say, the competitive landscape. However, when it comes to really assess who are, you know, the best rival to the most, uh, to the rival that are, uh, I would say, most indifferent to you, this is, uh, this is actually a safe bet. And, um, and so, if you do, if you conduct such a survey, um, and the way to conduct such a survey is fairly straightforward, you, you know, you, you send, uh, you identify your vendors, you send those two questions, you collect um, the answers, um, and uh, which includes its qualitative answers, uh, plain text, uh, but you also get, you know, implicitly uh, a ranking. You can even build a synthetic ranking if you wish. I just give uh, an example of a formula here for a synthetic ranking where um, uh, they, uh, uh, they I is essentially uh, the, 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 the ranks given about the vendor I. And uh, V of J with J on top is essentially um, the answers given by vendor J. And so you see, you, uh, again, the specifics will be given in annex uh, to this talk as a link, but with a very, very simple formula, uh, you can compute, you know, a synthetic rank if you want to kind of sort out uh, in the field of vendors that you believe to be relevant to your company uh, what sort of, of, of leaders really emerge with a very, very simple, you know, unbiased ranking mechanism. And so here what I've just presented is fundamentally what I'm referring to as uh, the vendor on vendor format. So it's literally the silver bullet perspective that, uh, that was pioneered, I believe, by, uh, by Warren Buffett. Uh, it's two questions. The second question is implicitly containing a, a ranking. And the idea is that when it comes to the answers, um, if you want to, 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 uh, to, to consolidate those answers, there is no edit needed. There is no, uh, just a minimal curation, you know, to eliminate the sort of garbage answers if you have people where you just realize that after they answer the question that they are not even operating in the space uh, that was of interest to you. So there is probably some, some curation if some answers are really not even, you know, adopting a professional tone or they are, they are just of, of exceedingly low quality, you probably want to, uh, to discard them. But otherwise, you know, the exercise is very, very straightforward. It is just a very simple collection. And what you get is, in the end, something that where it's not about uh, eliminating conflict of interest, it's just neutralizing conflict of interest through conflicting views. You see that the beauty of this vendor on vendor assessment is that conflict, due to the fact that you have conflicting views, you know exactly that every single answer that you get is biased, absolutely. But in aggregate, all of that can give you a very impartial view of the market and who are actually the really good companies that operate in this market. And this is exactly the essence of, uh, I believe, the, the, the methodology that explains uh, a big part of the success of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And as far as I know, by the way, I've been approached by many, uh, by, by many investors, you know, venture capitalists. I've never seen, uh, although I've seen probably over 100 venture capitalists in my life, I've never seen any uh, uh, any uh, um, investors actually using this trick. So it's very, it's very intriguing to me that uh, pretty much the, the most successful investor of all time is using a technique that is actually very simple, um, uh, very sensible, uh, but sometimes, you know, that's the elephant in the room. It's just too obvious, too simple. People are really want to go for something more sophisticated, but it's deceptive. Simplicity can be immensely powerful. Uh, sophistication is frequently an illusion. So, interestingly, when I started to probe, you know, uh, my own, uh, uh, um, I would say, uh, uh, people that I knew in this, in this domain on, on, this, uh, on this idea, a lot of objections were raised. And they are, they are very interesting, and I will actually address uh, those, those objections. Um, the first, market research firms. So first, the objection of market research firms is, 
um, nothing to see here. Um, you really need me and my, you know, key insight in this market so that you, you can get an actual, you know, uh, uh, unbiased market view. And I, again, I really much, I, I, I very much disagree with this statement, especially for all the market research firms that happen to be organizing any kind of trade show or event of any kind where vendors are, inv uh, where are invited. I, I really, <laughs> I believe that is, it's just a pretense. Um, when I think in terms of what are the secret objections that they cannot tell me, um, uh, it's very clear that uh, there is a lot of money on the table and the vendor-on-vendor -vendor study has one massive problem as far as market research firms are concerned, is that it's very, very cheap to conduct um, you know, vendor-on-vendor -vendor assessment, which is, by the way, exactly what um, uh, Warren Buffett was saying about his own techniques in an interview, is that ask the silver bullet test can be, you know, carried in literally in, uh, in, in, in a matter of hours, you can literally diagnose in pretty much any industry who, who are the key players. It's, it's dramatically efficient, you know, dramatically efficient. It, it, it removes all the noise um, because you, you, when you are doing a market research study, you do not care yet about all the, the, the fine print. You know, when you're picking a vendor, your goal is not to become an expert programmer or an expert software, an expert in software engineering of the specific of the solution yourself. You know, this is not your game. The game is really to uh, identify who are the good vendors in the market. And then uh, the vendors themselves. Um, some vendors were enthusiastic, but some other vendors, you know, fellow competitors of Locat, were thinking, no, I mean, this, this vendor on vendor assessment, you know, um, uh, it's a bad idea. It's going to be so negative. Uh, and I would say my, my counter objection to that is that, well, you know, it's not going to be any more negative than you make it to be. You know, you are the vendor providing the assessment of your peers. If you say bad things about your peers, then yes, the study is going to be negative, but you know, it's on you. If you say good things about your peers, uh, the, um, uh, the study is going to be fairly positive. So the fact that it's positive or negative is only on you. So you cannot, you know, say that it's going to, to be negative uh, no, it's only negative if you make it so. And then um, there is another class of objection, which is, oh, I, I just don't know. I just don't know my, my peers. I just don't know the other vendors. Well, if you say that, you know, how can you claim um, to have state-of-the-art technology if you don't know your peers? You know, uh, it is not possible by the very definition of having a state-of-the-art is that um, you, you know, you know, what the other guys are doing. Otherwise, you cannot possibly be. Uh, uh, state of the art. So for example, when a vendor claims that they have superior X or superior Y, I mean, obviously, to be able to claim that is that you, you, you know what the other guys are doing. Otherwise, what's your baseline to say that you have anything that is superior? So obviously, you, you cannot you know, claim ignorance. And I believe that um, the secret you know, objection is an uh, imposter effect. And by the way, I'm not saying imposter syndrome. Uh, the imposter syndrome is the fact that you feel like you're an imposter, although you do have expertise. No, no, the inspector, the imposter effect is that you are an, in, a, an imposter, so you have no expertise or you have a very low quality expertise and you just know it. And so the problem and the untold you know, uh, answer is just that, well, this, this sort of, of study is really threatening me because that would expose me for what I have, which is a vendor who pretend to be washing whiter than white, but with like literally nothing to support that claim. Um, so that's, that's literally you know, the, 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 the objection. And now, uh, the, the client. And so the, the client is, I believe, when, when I, I proved that, is that people would object, but it's not answering my questions. And again, we go back to um, the questions of the, the direct marketing, uh, di direct market research approach, where um, you want to ask your questions, all your pet questions, like do you support MOQs, do you support this, that, that, that. And here, I, I think, you see, um, you know, people who, once they understand what this, those questions are about, you know, it's just a facade because uh, you see, those questions, they are not very interesting. And, and yes, superficially, you can object that, uh, yes, it's not exactly my questions, but um, this is mostly, I would say, a bad faith uh, argumentation. Um, I believe that the, the, the secret objection is that um, asking those questions, you know, present yourself, present your peers, uh, just feels absolutely weird. You know, it's something that is even, you know, borderline rude. 
And I believe that is also one of the very simple explanations why the, the method that made the success of Berkshire Hathaway, again, most successful investment company of all time, to, um, uh, is, uh, is that just, it's just too weird and people, I think, uh, are kind of afraid. They are not necessarily afraid of doing bad things in a way. They are more afraid of doing weird things, which, which, feels, which can be kind of even more surprising. But I believe this is what it is. So those questions make people feel weird and those they don't do it. Although those questions are, um, I believe, um, just uh, simple and of excellent operating uh, efficiency. So now, if we want to do a quick re recap, you know, on this uh, on market research, essentially you have the direct method that primarily rely, I mean, that extensively rely on self-assessment. So the vendors gives you their opinion about themselves, and this is it, uh, one way or another, possibly with a few case studies in the middle. And and the the whole methodology relies on the fact that you expect honest answers from the vendors that you. And, and unfortunately, you see, you, this method is uh, undermined extensively by uh, conflict of interest, either from the vendors themselves, that's a dollars, dollars bonus at play, or from market research firms that pretend to be neutral but are not. And, so, and also, one of the, uh, that characterize, I would say, um, direct market research is that uh, the overhead is very, very large. You, know, you, are, you end up invariably asking tons of questions, and those, the more questions you ask, the more answers you get. And so um, the whole undertaking becomes you know, usually quite gigantic. And so you need consultants, you need tons of time just because you end up with a massive study. Uh, and it, it becomes, you know, so the, the amount of overhead involved are very, very large. And, in terms of end game, you converge toward a pay to win because whoever you know position uh, itself as the kind of neutral party in the market just get a massive uh, incentive to just you know establish the rules and devolve into a pay pay to win um, uh, sort of actor. And again, it doesn't matter whether what are the sort of initial intent, it is a very predictable devolution that is just going to be caused by the ongoing conflict of interest that are going to be suffered by the actors of the market. And so the adversarial perspective is relying on the assessment of others, your peers, your competitors. And so you can still expect bias, but it's going to be bias that are in the, in the interest of um, the client company who are trying to make an assessment. So that's very, very interesting. And so this approach of adversarial market research start from the, the as a starting point, you know, you start by thinking that there, are, that there is such a thing as bias, it's well understood, you know how it's getting played, and thus you just take advantage of that instead of, of, of thinking that you can you know, mitigate it. And thus, you don't end up with a, a conflict of interest, you end up with a study that represents conflicting interest. And you know, it's not just a play of words, it's that it's literally a very, very different take, conflicting interest, and that's, that in itself, the consolidation you know, of those conflicting interests can give you a very impartial view of a market. And um, in terms of positive quality, uh, the, uh, the overhead is completely minimal. You know, it's, it's literally probably uh, two or three orders of magnitude less effort to conduct an adversarial market research study compared to a direct market research study. And also, the idea is that uh, for the adversarial market research study, just because the fact that you obtain so little material in the end, you know, it, it can literally boil down to a few pages to present a, a, an entire you know, industry, is that um, you don't have to delegate your judgment to a third party company. You see, you can, you can keep this, uh, this choice in house. And I believe that uh, for, for the companies, you know, companies that operate supply chains, uh, I believe uh, that um, you should never delegate uh, a judgment to a third party. You know, you, you, your interests are best served by your own judgment. If you delegate your judgment to a third party, this third party will over time take advantage of you. Uh, and again, that do not depend whether the third party is honest or not. This is just a very predictable devolution of the market that will happen with, uh, with very, very high probability if you repeat the exercise numerous, uh, an, a large number of times. And so, literally, it's, it's interesting because in terms of end game uh, of the adversarial you know, market research, what we can expect, also I believe that mar uh, adversarial market research do not uh, really meaningfully exist yet, except as done by Berkshire Hathaway, uh, is that what we can expect in the long run is pay to watch. 
which was, by the way, the original business model of most mo uh, uh, market research firms where supposedly people were paying to get the reports and just the reports. Uh, and by the way, with these methods, we can even envision you know, a world where um, market research firms that operate along those lines can actually sell very cheap reports just because it's so, uh, it's so super cheap to actually conduct an adversarial market uh, research study. So, um, you see, in conclusion, um, I believe that epistemic corruption in the field of enterprise software is severe. And the, the consequence should not be underestimated. You know, when, when the, the, the domain knowledge itself is debased, you end up with massive problems. And so for supply chains, it means that, you know, those supply chains will remain uh, much more wasteful than they need to be, that they will not uh, achieve as much progress as, uh, as we want them to be. They will not generate all those sort of profit that, would, that we would expect from those supply chains. So those, those problems are diffuse, but considering that literally the, know, the, the world runs on those very large supply chains that's literally at, at the core of our modern industrial civilization, um, this is a very, very severe problem. Um, yes, nobody is dying, uh, but tons of money is wasted, tons of money that could be invested or reinvested into making uh, better things, you know. And so uh, I believe that adversarial ma market research is really um, a, a simple piece of the puzzle to really uh, address uh, in depth, you know, um, uh, the, the, so the problem of, um, of, of epistemic corruption of the, of the knowledge that we have in this field of um, enterprise software vendors. Um, and I would like to uh, present my uh, special thanks to um, Stefan de Kock and Sean Snap, who contacted me a few weeks ago and who gave me some, um, some, uh, some hints and the original idea of actually having a vendor assessing another vendor. Um, the views that I've presented today are mine uh, and mine alone. However, uh, the initial idea of having a vendor uh, uh, assessing another vendor was, um, uh, was actually an idea presented by um, Stefan de Kock and Sean Snap. And so, uh, by the way, I did conduct my very first, you know, uh, um, vendor on vendor study, and I did publish this study on um, uh, www.locat.com slash vendors. So obviously right now it's a very, very minimalistic study. It presents, uh, it presents 14 vendors that I co consider to be you know, um, rivals, peers. Uh, it's ranked from the, the, the company that I admire the most to the one that I feel to be uh, least relevant. And um, I would like today to extend an invitation to all my competitors to actually join, uh, join this study by actually uh, inserting their own views. It's relatively cheap. It can be done in a few hours. It's, uh, it's, it's not even one-tenth of the effort that it takes to actually you know, answer uh, a, a request for proposal, or request for quotation, as uh, you know, enterprise vendors also uh, provide those sort of answers all day long for, uh, as part of their regular activities. And, um, and I really believe that we have a unique opportunity to establish a superior form of knowledge um, and, and basically to, um, to, 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 um, to, to disrupt the market so that we can exit this sort of deadlock that is currently plaguing the world of enterprise software. And so I will be having a look at the questions. Give me one second. Um, so um, first questions. Um, Krishna's work for, so it's from Jesus Christ. Uh, Krishna's worked for free. High discipline fields would never work for free. The comparison is weak. Um, yes and no, yes and no. Because you see, uh, when you say Krishna's work for free, that do not explain how they were absolutely stunning vendors. You know, they literally sold, uh, 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 they, in terms of, of, of vendors of flowers as they were in the 70s, they, uh, they made, uh, they, they literally become, the, uh, they, they achieved a degree of proficiency in selling flowers in airport that was just completely unrivaled. And you see, the question is that if you can, um, so s paying your employees or not paying your employee is just a matter of cost. The question then is, can you sell more? And on the, on the baseline of being able to sell tons of flowers, Krishna's 
were, had absolutely stunning results to the point that this practice was actually banned just because it was so effective as a sales technique. So, so you see, the comparison is not weak. Um, uh, they have pioneered an incredibly efficient uh, sale technique, and that's Robert Saldini has actually uh, studied extensively, and they have reproduced those results under control environment. And by the way, it's absolutely not specific to, um, uh, to flowers. You can obtain the same results uh, under many, many conditions. You know, if you know exactly what sort of, of, of how to abuse the, the principle of reciprocity, you can achieve those effects in virtually every single field. And Due to the fact that this mechanism has been extensively studied by, uh, in experimental, methodology, uh, experimental psychology, it is now severely frowned upon when vendors play these games, just because it has been uh, identified. And over the world, regulation has been put in place to basically you know, put an end to those sort of shenanigans. So again, uh, the comparison, I believe, is absolutely relevant. This is absolutely relevant. And the key is, is there a mechanism to abuse this principle of reciprocity. This is not, I have nothing, you know, um, uh, Krishna is our religious movement. I have nothing, you know, against this movement. This is not the point. You know, it could have been any other religion. It just happened that the anecdote was about this religious movement. Um, Alexei Tikhonov, when decision maker doesn't know which question to ask and instead ask vendor about the demo, which vendor accept to do, does it qualify as abused reciprocity from your standpoint? No, no. Um, the thing is, uh, this is not reciprocity, you know, obviously, yes, um, because you see, this is something that you, that you expect, you know, the vendor to do it. And again, when, um, when a, a client uh, company interact with a vendor uh, to get a demo, you know, it's not because I spend half a, a, an hour of my time to give you a demo that you will feel that you own me something. You know, I, I don't think, um, I, I don't think, you know, that, that, that it, that it worked that way. Because literally people know that it's literally a demo, just like when you walk into a store and you see that there is a vendor that can do a demo for the product, you know, you're not going to buy the product just because the, some people did a demo in front of you. However, the, the real problem is that what you will get, what you will get from a demo is a very distorted view. Again, uh, dollars, um, um, dollars bonus. Do not expect a vendor, and that includes Locad, to present any of the weak aspect of the solution during the demo. For example, and that's something that all enterprise vendors that I'm <laughs> aware of are doing, is that when you have bugs, you know, you're going to make very sure that your demo is not going to hit the bugs. You, know, you don't want to demonstrate the bugs that you have in front of your clients. This is just common sense, you know, uh, um, uh, and uh, and so so you see, even if you if if you try to be very honest as a, as a vendor, don't as expect me to do a demo in which I'm going to demonstrate the uh, the bugs of my products. You know, that's not what I'm going to do. And again, this is uh, this this would be I would say qualify as kind of unreasonable expectation if you expect a vendor to present their product in a bad light. So when you do a demo, which is perfect, it's perfectly fine but you will essentially get a distorted view, you know? And that's fine, that's fine, but don't expect that this demo to be the truth. That's going to be, you know, a, a showroom, you know, a car that looks way more beautiful than it is in reality. So, uh, Ferreira 87, on the point, present yourself, present your rivals. You are assuming that vendors have unbiased and unlimited knowledge about competition. No, this is not what I'm saying. How many demos of vendors have you actually seen? Analysts and consulting company have seen all the tools. Um, so first, you know, uh, obviously you, you, you can take my words, you know, I, I could be telling you uh, sort of things, but um, I've been playing this game of being, you know, the CEO of Locat for 12 years, and I have seen de dozens of, of demos of competitors, and I have spent literally until weeks to reverse engineer um, all the publicly the, all the public materials that were available, you know, again, this is a fair game. <laughs> when I try to improve my own product, I try first to copy whatever I can copy to my, from my competitors. You see, so uh, as the CEO of, of Locad, I spend enormous amount of time. And by the way, I believe that I have tons of insider knowledge because you see, the problem of consultants is that consultants, yes, they have seen the demos, but they have not tried to re-engineer on their own the same thing. You see, because when I, for example, a, a, a competitor, let's say, say, oh, we are using this machine learning technique. I'm, I'm tr obviously, uh, you know, the machine learning technique is typically something well known that you can even find in, the, in, in open source. So 
uh, when people say, you sh I'm, we are using that, this machine, particular machine technique, it works great. What do you do? Well, you just grab the uh, open source uh, machine learning toolkit of, uh, of the day, and you just try that and see it for yourself. And, and, and you can see, as a, as a vendor, all the sort of problems that there might be with these techniques. You know, maybe uh, uh, one of your competitors is pushing a technique, but when you, you try to replicate this technique, you see that, yes, maybe, you know, some of the claims replicate, you know, there are some good points with these techniques, but there might be also tons of hidden flows. And you only see the problems if you actually try to re-engineer yourself the thing and to actually put it into production. So you see, the problem is that consultants, yes, they see, uh, they see the demos, but they haven't tried to actually re-engineer the thing. Because you see, again, uh, re-engineering is very important because, for example, in sort of hidden flows that you have in, in, in enterprise software is maintainability. You know, it's not about just producing a piece of software and making it work on day one. Is that 10 years from now, it is still maintainable. And that is something that you only see as a vendor. Because if you produce something that is, not, that is unmaintainable, then that means that it will complicate all the, the, the downstream software development that you want to do. You see, this is, this is a sort of insider knowledge that is very, very telling. Again, I'm not saying that consultants don't have their place. I'm saying that when you are actually playing the game, which is being a vendor yourself and engineering a product for the solution that you're trying to, um, th th that for the problem that you've identified and chosen, uh, by the very fact that you, that you do this effort, you are exposed to tons of problems. And that's also, by the way, the sort of things that Warren Buffett points out is that uh, uh, players in the market always see all the bad stuff. You know, publicly, they only speak about the good stuff, but they, al they also see all the bad stuff. Um, so, uh, Alex A. Tikhonov, the assessments of other is somewhat similar to 360 degrees employee assessment. Sometimes people give favorable assessment to each other without any reason but to look better than they actually are. How to avoid, uh, to, to avoid or detect uh, this effect in, uh, in vendor assessment? Well, the thing is, the thing is, um, my competitors are not my buddies. You see, uh, m most of my competitors, uh, as I look at, are companies that are, you know, hundreds of kilometers away from LOCAD. You know, I don't have to be friends with them. I don't live with them. The problem when you, are, when you want to have this sort of uh, assessment of your peers inside a company is that um, it, it becomes very, very quickly very toxic because you're part of the same team. Yes, you can give feedback, but if you're kind of too honest, you know, you have and you say something bad about someone, you have to live with the consequence of, of you saying something bad with this someone uh, while walking to the same office, maybe not during the pandemic, but every single day. So, so you have a big problem, you know, it's, um, it's very difficult, you know. So I, I believe that um, the 360 degree assessment inside a company is much more difficult just because, well, um, we are dealing about human be be beings, you know, and those people, it's very difficult not to befriend people that you act where if you happen to be, you know, working with them all day long. Um, and so it, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that when it comes to assessment of companies by other companies, you know, um, you, vendors will have much lesser, you know, they won't feel sentimental about saying something, you know, bad or about uh, a competitor. And certainly they will not praise a competitor that they know that is, uh, that, that is not, you know, a good player just to avoid displeasing this competitor. So you see, um, it's just that this sort of effect where you don't want to displease, well, you know, it's a competitor. I, I don't have to please my competitors. Uh, it's, uh, and I will certainly not praise competitors uh, that, uh, that, that, um, that don't force my, admi uh, my admiration, if you want. So, um, uh, Lois uh, Guimai, I believe it is more applicable to cuts commercial off the shelf software, while today many clients face make or buy choices in their digital and data supply chain transformation. The difficulty lies in defining the scope of the research package software platform full custom. Um, so first, uh, I believe that these techniques apply to very, very numerous fields. And, as, uh, and if you look at, again, the experience of Berkshire at a way of investing in dozens of industries, I would say, yeah, it kind of applying to anything. So 
uh, my specific personal interest lies in enterprise software, and enterprise software has always been, for decades, you know, a mix. It's not, uh, it's not on the shelf software. You know, it's, it's there is always an extensive degree of customization involved. Um, it is true for the largest vendors, like the smallest. This is really what enterprise software is about, especially when it comes to supply chains, where supply chains tend to be very complex and very unique beast. There is no two supply chains that are exactly, you know, build up the, the same way. So I believe that this, um, this methodology uh, can be applied to, uh, to vendors, whether those vendors have you know, on-the-shelf products, although you know, again, what is exactly an on-the-shelf product in the realm of enterprise software, which is a topic of interest. You know. But also, uh, it, it applies also if you have, um, that you have a, a fairly, fairly packaged software. So I don't think that it's a, that is a relevant distinction. In the sort of build or buy um, decision, that really pre that actually confirmed my point. You do not know what are the right questions to ask. You see, when you are going to do those, present your peers, they are going to give you hints on what are the sort of technologies um, that are worthy of admiration. What are the good directions? You know, even if you decide to do it in house, um, the problem with enterprise software is that there, you have so many options. You know, for every problem, you have a, a bazillion different directions to go at it. You know, the the the, the roads are endless. So the problem is, um, uh, what about you know leveraging this sort of market research to see people who, that, who have done that, so that they can tell you at least give you some very quick and cheap uh, insights on what sort of things in their eyes is really working. So again, if you say that you already uh, know more, then you position yourself as in being in the capacity to form a superior you know assessment, uh, technological assessment than the vendors themselves. It might be the case, it might be the case, but this is a very bold you know, statement that you're making. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and my point is that um, a, a large company can you know, make this sort of move for, um, for a couple of products, but it's not realistic to say that you're going to be, you know, to engineer in-house every single product in a super fashion. You know, there are very, very few companies that could say, I'm going to, for example, re-engineer the Linux kernel in a way that is superior to the Linux kernel. You know, if we take it to the extreme, there are things that are just exceedingly difficult and there are just very few software engineers on earth that have the sort of skill that it takes to actually deliver a better product. So that's the sort of problems, you know, again, um, my, my take is that even if in the end you want to uh, do something in-house, it's so cheap to do an adversarial market research. Literally, you can do it in a day. Just, you know, two questions, 20 vendors, you send 20 emails, and you're done, you know? Uh, and, and the sort of answers that you will get are fairly short, so it's not going to take, you know, uh, um, weeks of your time to form a, 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 a very firm idea on who are the key players and what are the sort of good ideas that they are pushing forward. Again, you don't even know what are the good ideas that you should be looking at. Um, so, Chris uh, Maskell, solution versus solution assessment, much less important than the quality of implementation. Uh, by large, all systems do the same thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's about how it's implemented, how it embraces the company, very rare. We choose the wrong system. It's more, we couldn't implement it properly or our users did not cope with the change. Um, on, uh, when you say solution do um, uh, the, all the same things, I very much disagree on this, although you know I have a fairly opinionated matter on, on the perspective, but if you look at the technical specification of LOCAD, um, you will see that LOCAD, and please give me that, LOCAD is a very, very different beast compared to um, the vast, vast majority of enterprise software vendors. So again, um, uh, and I claim to be very, very different. Uh, am I better? Well, you know, uh, dollars bonus. Obviously, I believe being the CEO of a software company that, you know, my company is better, but, you, you know, that bias. Um, however, I believe that without having too much bias, uh, we are exceedingly different, exceedingly different. And, um, and I believe also that I've talked to people that I consider as competitors, um, uh, for example, people that are proponent of, let's say, DDMRP, they believe, and I believe oh, that's my understanding, and they have good grounds to believe that, they are also very different, that they believe, and I, I, I agree with that. Are they better? It turned out that I kind of disagree with them. But on, on the fact that are they extensively different? Oh, absolutely. So. First, I really challenge the fact that all the vendors are the same. 
Absolutely not. And I've reviewed dozens of vendors and the sort of, of core, um, I would say, technological decision, design decisions, can have absolutely dramatic impact on everything that follows. So I really challenge that all vendors are the same. Um, vendors can vary in ways that are incredible. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling how different it can be to approach the same problem in very, very different ways. So I really challenge this assumption. And for me, it, it, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, you've, it's, uh, you've probably not seen enough you know, vendors. The, 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 they might be, I would say, approaches that are incredibly different at all levels. And then in terms of implementation, I would say, Yes, obviously, implementation matters, matters, but you know that's also part of your, um, when you pick a vendor, the question is that uh, it's part of the assessment of your peers. For example, you will see that in the assessment of the peers that I've made about LOCAD, I present certain of other vendors and saying they have a very good uh, ecosystem, internal ecosystem, to do the support and the implementation precisely. So you see, uh, when, when you say you have a, a, a peer that you admire a lot, you can actually admire the sort of ecosystem that, uh, that they have surrounded themselves with. Uh, that can have a lot of value. So those ecosystems of people that can do the implementation on top of your product, it doesn't fall from the sky. It's very much, it takes a lot of efforts from the vendors themselves. So, so what I'm saying is that as part of uh, the vendor assessment, you know, uh, I, I, the question is very open, is present your peers, you know, what you admire the most about them, and there is no, uh, there is no limit. You can say anything you want, and you can say that you admire one of your peers uh, because uh, the ecosystem that they have, um, that they have uh, created is just fantastic and they have superior capacity to execute. This is, uh, and that, is, that can be completely, I would say, uh, um, uh, um, uh, orthogonal compared to the, uh, to the technology. Again, I'm not, this is not the point that I'm making. You see, those questions are very open-ended. The vendor can say anything they want about their peers. There is not like boxes to be ticked. Okay, um, so I, I guess um, this is it for today. Um, so two weeks, uh, two weeks from now, uh, it will be same day of the week, Wednesday, same hour of the day, uh, 3 p.m. time of Paris. I will be presenting writing for supply chain. See you next time.